So I'm uh, Peter, who's the uh, kind of the lead organizer as the uh, chair of the International Study of Arctic Change, or ISAC, that's run out of University of Calgary, um, who on this call is being represented by Ravi Sankar, uh, who also had a hand in putting together these slides here as, as somebody who's working with the ISAC team in providing some of the support for the Arctic Observing Summit. Um, anyways, I, I was asked to give a, a brief overview update. Um, there's a few important things uh, with respect to Arctic Observing Summit. The one I want to highlight is that the, the white paper um, process is underway. So we're inviting community white papers that help inform discussions and conversations at the summit. And I'll be talking about that a bit more here in a few minutes. Um, what is the AOS? If, if I look at the, uh, the number or the names of people on the call here, there's probably 85 to 90% who know this as well as I do. But just a brief reminder, uh, the goal of the Arctic Observing Summit, which we're trying to move um, beyond just a, a biannual meeting into an actual process, is to support the design, implementation, coordination, and sustained operation of an international pan-Arctic observing system or observing system of systems. And um, those of you who followed this um, work for some while know that this is a collaborative effort, so it's trying to muster bottom-up um, um, contributions from different countries, different groups that are active in observing, ranging from individual projects, like the one that John Toole is leading with the uh, with uh, um, ice tethered profiles, all the way up to regional observing systems with the with the broader understanding that for, for a comprehensive Arctic observing system, we're, we're not going to start from scratch with a blueprint. We, we have to work together to put different pieces um, into better connection. And so in that context, the AOS process is also cross-disciplinary. Uh, it includes very much uh, activities driven at the community level, uh, both in terms of the observations and the data use and guidance. And, and as such, it's also um, basically um, a, um, a sort of a, a, a bifocal uh, summit in, in the way, in the sense that we're drawing on expertise from the research community as well as from um, data and observing system users. Um, here, here's another way to think about this. Um, so, so again, the key words here are that the Observing Summit is a platform for conversations and joint planning. It's a forum um, and, and a workspace. And um, again, we're, we're working closely with SEON, the SEON initiative of the Arctic Council and IAST to build up additional resources so that we can really truly operate as a workspace and, and a process. Um, the, um, you know, the various groups that we see as being interested and involved in an Arctic Observing Summit, again, aren't just members of the research community, but very much those who live in the Arctic, uh, various agencies that have jurisdictions or activities in the Arctic, the private sector, um, NGOs, and, and a range of others. Um, who are either contributors or users of, of data from the coordinated observing system. Um, the, the four Arctic observing summits that have taken place so far, um, starting with one in Vancouver, kind of have, have been on, on somewhat of a trajectory, though with, you know, with a bit of zigging and zagging um, with, a, with the community trying to identify what works best in terms of um, engaging the data users and the data contributors and observers more broadly. And um, we're, we're optimistic that with the next AOS in 2020, we'll actually be able to further zero in on, on a model that works most effectively for, for the majority of those involved and interested. Um, I just want to highlight um, the last observing summit um, in Davos, Switzerland was part of the Polar 2018 meeting. So that was, a, was both an opportunity, but also a bit of a challenge. And if you look at the, um, the key um, outcomes and, and themes from the, uh, from the 2018 summit that I'm showing here, this is actually a graphic that comes out of uh, a really nice um, synthesis of the past observing summits 
um, and, 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 and the reports and, and products resulting out of those that you can also download at the Arctic Observing Summit uh, website. I'll, I'll give you a link here later on. Um, and Ravi in particular was, was instrumental in, in getting this together. But if you look at the, um, the different themes from the uh, 2018 summit, you see that in particular societal benefits are highlighted here. And, and we, thanks to efforts of a number of people here on the call, are, are really um, happy with the way that we've been able to demonstrate both qualitatively and increasingly quantitatively what are specific benefits um, to be derived from coordinated observations in the Arctic. And the 2018 summit in particular kind of launched into a series of products and activities that were um, part of the Arctic Science Ministerial um, and that um, in, in, in fall of 2018, and that furthermore helped drive other, other processes that are currently underway. So that's something we're building on for the 2020 summit. And the hope there is that we'll get into more, um, sorry, into more, into more detailed um, discussions and, and planning efforts. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna sh pull up these slides here. Um, these are the, the recommendations and call to action from the 2018 AOS. Uh, the, the presentation has been posted here kindly by Kelly, so you can review this yourself. Um, the, the key thing to, um, to note is that again, these, these recommendations weren't just recommendations that are kind of going out into the ether, but, but various groups have worked with this building on the, um, the activities at the summit. I just like to highlight also because he's on the call here, the, the data group that's been um, co-led by Peter Pulsifer, who have been very active in that context. Some of you may have seen the invite for the third polar data forum. The third polar data forum actually is, is helping sort of transition some of the data related topics from the last AOS into the next AOS. Um, and so the next AOS will be hosted um, in uh, Akureyri, Iceland. Uh, it's part of course uh, of the Arctic Science Summit Week. Um, so the specific dates for the fifth Arctic Observing Summit are March 31st through April 2nd. The, if, if you follow this link here, that'll take you to the website where you, you find more information on ASSW and, and AOS. But I just wanna briefly um, review here uh, the various uh, themes and, and sub-themes for that summit with the overarching theme being observing for action um, as, as part of this evolution where we're now looking much more specifically at how are observations informing action and action being a range of activities uh, ranging from providing decision support to providing scientific insights or helping local communities uh, respond to Arctic change. Um, so um, uh, just a brief review of the working groups as they have been currently uh, established. The one um, working group number one that's um, co-led by Roberta Pirazzini with the Finnish Meteorological Institute, Alice Bradley, um, with uh, Williams College and, and myself is focusing on the observing system design optimization implementation topic. And, and again, you can review the key elements of, of this working group here. We're very much seeing ourselves, if you look at item D here, um, as a working group that's supporting the SEON roadmap for Arctic observing, something that Sandy can tell you much more about, but that is getting us now to a point where we're starting to, to align various activities in the different Arctic and non-Arctic countries and um, as such, we, we see ourselves as a kind of as, as one of the elements um, that contribute to a much more specific roadmap for Arctic observing that's going to underpin uh, and provide guidance to various people who want to contribute to Arctic observations or who want to get a sense of where the, the system as a whole is headed. Working group two is much more focused on the climate um, uh, change adaptation and mitigation piece. Currently, the, the, uh, the lead that's been identified as Mary Beth Murray, who's, who's also um, 
running the ISAC office out of the Arctic Institute of North America at the University of Calgary. Um, working group number three is, is a working group to keep a close eye on because this, this is a group that's, that draws on um, a, a longer thread of, of discourse around the theme of indigenous um, concerns and interests with respect to sustained observations in the Arctic. And that discussion and conversation has now reached a level of maturity where this group has focused on the, the topic of food security. Um, and, and while this is not yet apparent from, from the brief description you see here, there's already been quite a bit of legwork done by Rochelle Daniel and others, uh, including people like Lena uh, Kielsenholm from Greenland and others to actually prepare the ground not just for a conversation around food security, but, but actual data products. And, and sort of as a side note, this fall uh, in, in September, actually in, in, in a few weeks, the, um, the Committee on uh, Earth Observing Systems, CIOS, is going to convene their strategy implementation team here, the international team here in Fairbanks, Alaska. And we will try to inject this whole question of how can the satellite remote sensing community inform some of this this effort here, that's, that's part of the Indigenous Food Security Working Group as well. Um, on the data end, um, the lead, uh, or one of the co-leads that's been identified for the, for the data working group is Peter Pulsifer. He can speak to this in more detail, so I'm, I'm just going to highlight that that group has made substantial progress and is, is very much drawing on other forums, in particular the Say on Arctic Data Committee and the Polar Data Forum to, to kind of move things forward. And finally, working group five is looking at Arctic observing in a global context that's co-chaired uh, at this point by Thorstein Gunnarsson, who's also the um, chair of the of SEON, um, of the SEON board, and Jan Rene Larsen, who's, who's running the, the SEON secretariat. And um, this is very much a working group that's seeking to build stronger connections with global efforts such as GEO or GEOS, as well as other regional efforts such as the Svalbard Observing System. Um, so the final uh, point here, just a link to the two reports that may give you a bit more of the background of, of the conversation that's been happening so far. Oops, and, and then um, of course, very important, um, and I just realized I don't have a slide on this, but if you visit the arcticobservingsummit.org website, you'll find prominently placed a link that gives you additional information, instructions, and a template for a community white paper. So the key point about community white papers, if I, if I just add that real quick here, is that um, we're looking for contributions on ideally any of these five um, working groups here, and you, you find more guidance and, and additional information on the, uh, on the website but we also welcome other white papers that um, relate in, in one way or another to, uh, to, to the broader topic of the Arctic Observing Summit. Those white papers are gonna be um, reviewed and then collated for the summit itself. And we're also planning to um, uh, have a special issue just like for summits in the past of, of, a, uh, of a peer reviewed journal for, for a subset of these white papers. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it up. Um, uh, for, for questions. Thanks. Thank you, Hayo. Um, I noticed uh, Renee Tatesco uh, entered something in the chat. Renee, if you want to um, share that with, share further thoughts on that, I think that would be useful. You might be on mute, Renee. I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Hayo, you mentioned that working group two has a climate context, and I was wondering if perhaps this presents an opportunity for the new WMO Arctic Regional Climate Center network initiative possibly to plug in. So what I did is since, um, uh, since, since, since Kelly had shared your PDF presentation, I went ahead and sent that to Helge Tangen in Norway, who is the lead for the network, and have suggested that perhaps uh, uh, the uh, uh, Arctic RCC network 
uh, consider submitting a contribution. I don't know if, if you think that might be worthy or not. Oh, uh, definitely. I think that's a great suggestion. And, and uh, it, it may even, uh, you know, it might be worthwhile to consider whether somebody like Helga Tangen would, would um, be interested in being involved in, in leading some of the conversations around that theme. So uh, that's, that's a great point. Thanks, Renee. You're welcome. I'll even, uh, I'll suggest that to Helge as well. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and please do, um, I mean, Ravi is on the call here. So Ravi, if you can make the connect with Mary Beth as well, that would be great. Thank you. Sure Say hi, oh, I, I see that the white papers and short statements are due by October 18th. It's a good date to keep in mind. Yes, thank you. One thing I would uh, remind folks of from the summit two years ago uh, that, and, and the previous one in Fairbanks is that um, groups or, or individuals who were participating in, in the IARPIC observing team call um, came together around, uh, people shared their ideas of what they were planning to do for white, white papers and short statements. And I know it's, exceptionally helpful for the organizers if people team up on these to the greatest degree possible so that there's not a proliferation of individual uh, contributions. So um, what I would say is that maybe, um, you know, time being short, we probably won't necessarily convene specifically around that topic, but maybe in the comments field, people could submit ideas that they think would be valuable uh, white papers or short statements that they might be interested in in leading or teaming up on um, And then we can maybe generate some some synergies in advance of the call for white papers uh, through the collaboration site That's a yeah, great that's idea Sandy and I'll be happy to kind of kick that off I'll type a reminder with everyone who is on the call today. Thanks. Yeah, that would be really helpful because um I mean, for those of you who are part of the Ocean Ops 19 white paper process, you know, Ocean Ops is, is going to take place here in, in, in some, some weeks from now. I mean, that, that was one of the shortcomings, you know, that you, you now have 100, even, you know, 120 odd white papers that, that's difficult to sift through. And there's a lot of, you know, divergence in those that it would be great to resolve those types of issues during the white paper writing process. And, and certainly um, one of our hopes is that as, as you bundle these things uh, prior or build, you know, contact other collaborators internationally, that then that would also lead to very compelling follow-on papers that, that would be submitted to, to a peer review journal. Thanks. Any other questions or comments uh, for HIO and the AOS team on this? Hi, John. Um, it just occurs to me that there's going to be a lot of overlap with these ocean OBS white papers on polar oceanography and, you know, how many of these white papers do we actually need? Well, that, that's a good point, John. I, I think um, I, I would turn this around and say, well, that's a challenge to the polar oceanography community to just submit one white paper that represents the consensus from Ocean Ops 2019. Um, but then, of course, there's more than just oceans. And so, um, you know, looking at the other parts of the system are, are going to be, you know, that's going to be highly relevant. Plus, I mean, if you look at the, uh, I mean, you're a co-author of, of at least one of the Ocean Ops white papers, right? I mean, those are those are not as, those are much more driven by, I would say by sort of the, the research community um, and less, there's less of a pull apparent from actual data users from, from what I can tell uh, with respect to what's shown for the Arctic. So Ocean Ops is gonna be a good opportunity to, um, you know, the meeting itself to, to see how you can, how you can bring those, those two parts together. If, if I can, uh, I'll, John, um, I was just speaking with Craig Lee a couple days ago, who was the lead author on um, 
that I, there's kind of two big ones. Uh, one is more technology based that I think you were a uh, co-author on and this one led by Craig, which was more uh, kind of framework and organizationally oriented. One thing we had already thought was rather than write a whole new white paper is to write a short statement pointing to the white paper and maybe a joint short, short statement between those two white papers indicating the key takeaways and, and some of the results from Ocean Ops would be valuable so that um, it can be more of a progressive uh, type of a process that can, that can benefit from the AOS opportunity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense rather than reinventing the wheel. Okay, so looking at the time, we should probably um, roll forward to our next um, talk. Uh, and I'm sure Haya would welcome any offline comments or suggestions for um, working group uh, support uh, through either the, the comment fields in the meeting or, or via email. So thanks very much, Haya, for the overview, and, and we're all looking forward to the process. Kelly, should I, should I just load up slides from my side? Uh, yeah, if you just want to show it on your side, that would work. <clears throat> and it looks like uh, Bill has pasted his contact information into the chat about collaborating on a paper to submit to working group one. Um, I'll be sure to capture that and posted in the notes. Thanks. Okay, are you, are you seeing uh, the first slide now? Okay, so, oops, a little bit of an echo. Uh, so what I'm gonna present on today is um, actually uh, some results of the, uh, the drafting process that I've um, discussed in previous phone calls um, for SEANS Roadmap for Arctic Observing and Data Systems, which we're calling ROADS, even though um, it's a somewhat dyslexic acronym. It was, it was too tantalizingly close to ROADS to pass up on. Um, so, so bear with us that, uh, that we're going with that acronym. I've listed the members of uh, the drafting team. This was a drafting team impaneled uh, by the SEAN board. Um, to, uh, to draft the document that I'm gonna describe further here. So I think most of you on the call are familiar with SEON. It's the International Sustaining Arctic Observing Network uh, process, an intergovernmental process um, that is, uh, is co-sponsored by uh, the International Arctic Science Committee, which Larry mentioned earlier um, that, that he's the, uh, the president of currently and the Arctic Council's Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. It was created during the IPY to, um, to develop stronger coordination internationally for both uh, Arctic and non-Arctic countries who are interested in collaborating on, on, um, on observations. And what I show here is a sort of conceptual uh, need that still exists in the community and that SEON is uniquely positioned to support. And that's a, a mechanism to get all of the various large observing efforts, um, some which exist under the global programs like Global Cryosphere Watch, some which are regional like ALOCA, um, others which are, uh, uh, or I should say ALOCA is, is uh, regional in the sense that it's panarctic also but ma many of these are panarctic and some are highly localized like the Svalbard integrated um, observing system but what what these programs um, currently do not have that SEAN sees a space for itself to create is a common mechanism uh, to uh, to assess and and develop requirements um, that for the observing system um, at a level that uh, can can be integrated across these systems, but not interfere with how these systems themselves are proceeding um, with their own planning and development. And so as Hayo mentioned, uh, there's many active efforts already going on. We don't want to start from scratch. 
So the charge from Rhodes, which really came out of uh, the Arctic Observing Summit um, in Davos, if you looked at under recommendation number three, uh, it was to generate um, some kind of a conceptual framework where these systems could come together uh, and do some collective assessment and requirements development. Um, and, and at a more detailed level, after convening several times, the group from the Arctic Observing Summit realized that there was a leadership role for, for Sayon to come in and more um, develop a stronger uh, definition of what it meant by a roadmap. A roadmap can mean a lot of different things. And also to define specifically how it would like to see Arctic societal benefit areas or other objectives shape uh, the roadmap. Um, as we saw from the last Arctic Observing Summit, societal benefit areas were also much in discussion. So with this two-handed charge, develop a definition or guidelines for the roadmap and um, identify how Arctic societal benefit areas um, should be used. Uh, earlier this year, Sayon impaneled the drafting team that I mentioned earlier. So a word on, on what we mean by societal benefit areas and specifically um, pointing to the International Arctic Observing Assessment Framework. So this was a document that um, was uh, co-led by the Science and Technology Policy Institute of the US uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy and SAON uh, in early 2017. And the purpose of this effort was to develop the, the upper level um, uh, kind of policy driven aspects of a framework that would help to assess the Arctic observing system. And we wanted to develop Arctic specific societal benefit areas to be of highest relevance um, to regional efforts. And so compared to other global societal benefit or uh, UN sustainable development goal things, you can see the shift. Um, we don't necessarily talk about agriculture, but we talk about food security. Um, uh, the, the concept of socio-cultural services is also something that um, is, is a very, uh, you know, Arctic specific uh, familiar concept for people living in the region, in particular indigenous peoples. Um, who, whose traditional homelands span uh, the Arctic region, um, but also more traditional, uh, or I would say more global uh, types of benefit areas like um, disaster preparedness or weather and climate. I would say importantly, in light of the, uh, the strong role of the research community in Arctic observations, this societal benefit area also includes um, under point number four, fundamental understanding of Arctic systems. So very often in these societal benefit frameworks, just understanding and knowledge are not included. And so it can be difficult to bring research, the research community into these frameworks when there's not a, a sort of um, comparable way to understand the contributions of research-based observing. And so this is specifically the framework I'm referring to when I talk about the Arctic societal benefit areas, but we also recognize that there's other relevant frameworks. So um, now I'll just provide some, uh, some of the outcomes of the drafting process. Uh, we have just completed the drafting process. The, the draft document is gonna be some, uh, circulated for the review, out to a review team. Um, starting uh, today or tomorrow, something in that time frame. So it's not preemptive to be sharing some of these things with you now. Um, so in terms of the kind of basic principles and assumptions that we felt were important to state in um, the, the roads process specifically, uh, that one is recognizing that in creating this roadmap, um, that many of these component activities already have their own uh, frameworks and processes for organizing information. And so we wanted the roadmap to be, to operate at a meta level um, where it didn't interfere with how these uh, component networks or global networks already organized themselves, but gave them an opportunity to come together and see each other and merge at a higher level. Um, so our, that, that speaks to this principle that we wanted to do something that would be complementary to what existing networks are already doing. 
Uh, the second principle um, is that we wanted to develop something that could support stepwise development. Uh, we, we know the, the budget realities for Arctic observing um, at present and that we need to be able to uh, we need to be able to find areas um, of uh, imperative areas where we need to proceed very quickly and have a mechanism where other other communities can can join in later um, in more of a federated structure. Uh, and we also wanted to allow for um, for a lot of bottom up participation. We have these existing networks um, that are already recognized partners of Sayon. Um, this gives them an opportunity to follow a process um, and, and more explicitly contribute to the SEON framework. And then last um, was the, the clear recognition that in order for the, the roads process to be uh, successful, um, it doesn't just need to include um, indigenous peoples, but it needs to include funding for indigenous peoples to participate. Um, and this funding has to be included from, from the inception through the implementation um, of, the, of the roads development process. And so that's a point that we'll underscore at a couple different levels um, in the roadmap uh, development. I should note that these principles are really presented um, as an addendum to the other general guiding principles that SEON already uses, which are listed in its strategy. I don't repeat those guiding principles here. There is that full list and, and we will be following that full list of guiding principles in addition to these. Um, how are we going to, how do we propose to approach um, the roadmap? So what, in reviewing uh, many different programs, global programs like the, uh, the framework for ocean observing that falls under the global ocean observing system, regional, um, regional programs like the circumpolar biodiversity monitoring program and more, uh, we certainly re re recognize the, the value of following um, an essential variables approach. And so it, what we're describing the roads approach as is an essential Arctic variables approach. And I'll speak to how this both uh, leverages what the global programs are already doing um, with a recognition of Arctic value. So for those not familiar with essential variables, essential variables are always conceptually broad. So a good example is sea ice. Um, we generally don't think of sea ice as a variable uh, because it's, uh, it's measured in so many different ways. But as a broad category, it provides a structured interface for coordination. Um, and also as a broad category, it can be, uh, it can be readily mapped in through value tree assessments um, to a societal benefit framework. And so that speaks to the first point that we uh, envision um, essential variables, that they'll be identified for their criticality to achieving Arctic societal benefit. Um, and so things that, things that uh, speak to many of those 12 areas I listed previously that are highly impactful, those are the kinds of things that'll float to the top. Um, in the, in the roads process. So that's how they're identified. How are they defined? Uh, essential variables are defined by their observing system requirements. What are the components of something like a sea ice uh, essential variable that would need to be monitored to uh, comprehensively um, define sea ice? Um, you know, we think of these very basic observing system requirements like spatial re resolution, frequency, coverage. Importantly, the, the essential variables are defined in a way that's technology neutral. So we don't look at what the existing technologies are necessarily at this step, um, but just say what needs to be done and where does it need to be done. In the third step, we do look at specific technologies. We describe how they need to be implemented. Where are the ready technologies? Um, that can be integrated, what do their data systems look like, how can these data systems be integrated um, in order to create a, a fully defined and, and successfully deployed essential variable. So that's the overall approach that we envision that roads will, um, will result in a collection of well-defined essential Arctic variables. 
how are the, how how are how is this process going to proceed? Oh, I'm sorry. I should have mentioned um, before I before I get into how we're going to do this is getting back to this point about generating alignment with the global programs. Um, the example I gave for sea ice, we know that sea ice is already an essential ocean variable of the global um, uh, ocean observing system. So what would it mean to develop an essential Arctic variable for sea ice? Well, it would probably look like uh, one in terms of sea ice, redefining what the Arctic specific um, benefits and, and objectives are for the observing system based on the, uh, the observing system framework that I mentioned earlier. So we would wanna make sure that the sea ice variable is well-defined in order to achieve those benefits. But you also need to look at Arctic specific conditions. Um, we have to observe uh, sea ice differently in, for example, uh, the Arctic than we do in the Southern Ocean. And so we would want to make sure that the requirements for those observations were regionally relevant. And so this is how we envision that the, the, the Sayon Roads process could um, be based off of uh, existing variables from global programs, but the Roads process would add value through uh, that regional context. So how are we gonna do this? What we're proposing to do is uh, to uh, follow a governance process that's gonna balance the, the top down with the bottom up as is consistent with SEON's guiding principles. We're proposing to create a, a SEON advisory panel. Um, this may be uh, uh, an extension of the activities of the existing committee on networks. Um, or it may be a, a related body that meets under the Committee on Networks. Um, but it would include, uh, say, on board members, uh, probably members also of the Arctic Observing Summit and some of the other uh, uh, related um, committees for say on. That's the top down. Um, and I'll explain what that advisory panel is responsible for in a moment. And then we imagine this being met from the bottom up by SEON expert panels, which come out of uh, the large SEON networks that already exist, um, the ISOA, SIOS, um, distributed biological observatory type of programs, uh, but also programs on uh, large programs on revolving funds like Intaros. Um, and, and to be clear that this really needs to be, this really needs to proceed as a partnership activity. SEON envisions um, being able to generate some core funding for uh, the SEON secretariat itself in order to um, coordinate this process. But in order to develop the level of details that we would need for the roadmap, we need expert panels to come in. And we envision that these expert panels are gonna be generating their own funding to do this. So a little more detail, um, as I mentioned, a standing advisory body. Uh, the advisory panel is going to assure that the, the essential Arctic variables um, are identified, defined, and implemented according to the principles. And it's going to foster integration um, across expert panels, um, help make sure that these panels are, are well uh, coordinated with global networks, um, and work to uh, generate more participation. The expert panels, as I mentioned, we envision these being led by existing regional programs. For example, AMAP is already looking um, at the global climate observing system essential variables and which of those uh, variables are most important to AMAP in order to accomplish its mission. This is a really good example of a work that's in progress that we're hoping to um, stream into the roads process. Uh, but other global networks, large research networking activities, um, we hope these get involved as well. Uh, this this um, principle of identify, define, and implement is what is meant by phase one, phase two, phase three. These are three steps that we see happening um, that are led by these expert panels. So what comes next? Um, as I mentioned, uh, the, the document um, that outlines what we're now uh, really referring to as guidelines more than a definition um, is, uh, is in a review period from now until September 20th. 
Um, if you're interested in uh, getting a look at the document and having an opportunity to review it, I can put you in touch with Jan Renee Larson of the SEAN Secretariat. We have lots of outreach planned as well, um, including uh, participation in an ocean ob session, a, a, a special session on the roadmap at the Arctic Circle Assembly. Um, we have yet to submit an abstract to the Polar Data Forum, but plan to do so. And um, we'll likely participate in um, uh, both AOS and ISR-6, which we see as key inputs to the third Arctic Science Ministerial as well. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of the expert panels and how we're going to proceed with the development, we um, already know that there's some proposals um, in review and in formulation uh, to support some pilot efforts in this process. And um, so we're very encouraged that these things are, are already underway and um, very optimistic about uh, being able to get to work on this fairly quickly. So with that, um, please reach out to me for more info. Um, Jan Renee Larson, if you're interested in uh, reviewing um, the current draft, and then uh, I'll refer you to arcticobserving.org, which is SEAN's website for more information on SEAN in general. Um, and I'll take your questions. Thanks so much, Sandy. Any questions? I'm trying to. Uh, Sandy? Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, in the chat, there's a chat from Renee Tosusco um, asking if you've briefed Meredith Rubin, who's the new senior Arctic official at Department of State. So, so no, we have not, um, Renee, and thanks for that. What we do have is uh, on, our, um, on our drafting team, uh, and in fact, I think I forgot to put her name on here, is Sarah Callock, who is um, the, uh, one of the, uh, the AMAP representatives from Canada who um, is helping with our interface between uh, uh, AMAP and, of course, I've briefed uh, Ben D'Angelo, who's the U.S. representative to AMAP um, on this, but I think that that type of briefing would probably follow uh, from some of the outreach that we're doing right now, so it's, it's a great suggestion. Okay, um, if there's nothing else, I think we'll turn it over to Peter to talk a little bit about the third data, third polar data form. Great, thank you. And if you just bear with me a moment while I do my screen share, you should see my screen, I hope. And before I speak with you about the polar data form, so I'm just trying to get into presentation mode here. It's, Swap displays, that should now provide you with my deck, great. Um, I'm just going to provide a little bit of background uh, to the forum just to provide you with some context and then I'll go into the, the details of the event. Um, so a lot of this activity that I've been engaging in along with many others, um, many on the call as well as others, uh, has been for the Arctic at least through the Arctic Data Committee and the Arctic Data Committee has been referenced a couple of times. It's actually a joint body of the International Arctic Science Committee and the Sustaining Ar Arctic Observing Networks uh, program. And it was formed in late 2014, so established not quite five years ago. And it really came out of a lot of the discussions that were happening uh, throughout the International Polar Year and beyond. Now, it's a committee that's working closely with the um, process that Sandy mentioned, as well as the increasingly the Arctic Observing Summit, 
Um, but I think it's important for us to recognize that it's it's a member of what I think about as a as an ecosystem or a, a whole community of different organizations. Um, and here's just a, a little sample of some of the organizations that we're working with because we recognize that this is not strictly an issue that Sayon or I ask is going to uh, work through or, or a, a topic area, uh, nor is it specific to the Arctic. Uh, we have lots happening in the Antarctic as well as the mountain regions, the, the um, third, so-called third pole, but also globally. Uh, most of the issues that we're discussing around data sharing, um, data ethics, interoperability, all these types of things are being discussed um, across many disciplines in all parts of the world. So we're doing our best to focus on the needs of our, our particular circumpolar community, uh, including indigenous communities, indigenous organizations, but also recognizing that, that we don't want to do this in a silo. So we're working with larger groups like the WMO, like GEO, um, the Research Data Alliance, and so on. And so in some cases, that's sort of a loose affiliation. In other cases, we have very direct representation, such as the, the case of, of WMO. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there for the moment, but I think we'll, we'll come back to that when we're talking about the, the details. Um, I also just wanted to point out that we have quite a bit of history. Um, this is not a new conversation, um, and this is actually just a, a listing that comes from a, a website that we put together for one of our workshops just to provide people with some background. So I've been working in this area for quite a number of years and and you know one of the first workshops I, I attended um, where I met some of the people who were on this this call and and others was in 2006 actually and that was in preparation for the international polar year and what's really interesting is if you go back to that report we have a vision for systems that we're now starting to see um, come into play. Now that might seem like a long time, but when you think about what's happened in terms of technology, et cetera, to enable that, um, what was needed, um, it's, it's actually quite good progress um, to come where we were then, which was a completely disparate systems with really very little or no connectivity. Um, you know, interoperability was not happening at any level to one now where we're starting to connect the various systems. Uh, we have major funding in place and all kinds of opportunities to really make a lot of progress in the coming years. So one of the important developments, and you'll see that sort of about the middle of this list, is you see the communique for the first Polar Data Forum. One of our risks coming out of the International Polar Year was that, you know, there was that big push, there was funding, a lot of activity, a lot of interest, and the concern was that that was all going to sort of fade away as we left the International Polar Year behind us. Um, so there were some activities just towards the end of the IPY um, in Montreal, particularly the conference there where there's a lot of discussion on how to keep these things going. So one of the first attempts to do this was very successful. It was hosted by our friends um, at NIPR in Japan, along with a number of other partners, including I ask the World Data System, ICSU, SCAR, et cetera. And we brought together a number of different uh, organizations. We had about uh, 80 people there. And in that case, we were mostly just you know, talking about, well, what are the issues that we have to resolve? What are our, our problems? How do we want to do this? How do we want to coordinate? Um, so there was a communique that came out of it, and there were some other activities, a special issue, and so on. Um, and that helped us to make some progress. We also then um, fast forward to 2015, a couple of years later, uh, Ellsworth Ledru of University of Waterloo and I co-chaired the second Polar Data Forum. So in this case, I think we made a lot of progress from the first in that we started moving the conversation from one that was mostly data managers and you know technicians to a much broader conversation. We had about 110 people there, but what was interesting, about a third of those people were data managers and technicians, a third were um, researchers and, uh, and others uh, sort of uh, working in, in the field, and then about a third were people from indigenous organizations, funders, uh, policymakers, senior government folks, and so on. So it really expanded the scope of, of what we were, were trying to do and discuss. So I think that was critically important as, as a stepping stone. One of the things that we realized there was that we all wanted to move from, you know, talking about this stuff to, you know, taking action on this. 
And, you know, this is happening in the context of individual projects and programs getting funded and, and so on. So there is a lot of activity going beyond these discussions. Um, last year, we had the Polar Data Planning Summit in Boulder, Colorado, and that set us up to start moving towards, you know, very active conversation and detailed conversations about, you know, what kind of technologies and approaches are we going to take? Um, I know Ruth Durer and Bill Manley are both on this call, so they're very instrumental in moving us forward on this idea of federated search, connecting all the various catalogs from that big cloud of logos that I provided you so to you so that, you know, when you're trying to find data, you don't have to go to so many different places to find the data that you need. So a lot has been achieved there, and there's a white paper and a journal article coming in place there, and then some work that I'll talk about that's going to happen at the third Polar Data Forum coming up um, that will help us move fully into implementation there. So the Polar Data Planning Summit was a planning summit, and we realized that we were making great progress, and by giving people the time and space to roll up their sleeves and really get down in a detailed conversation that a lot got done in a very short period of time, so we proceeded to organize and we, you know, some of this is funded, some of this we're just sort of stitching together as we can, but we wanted to keep the momentum going. So later last year, we organized a, a meeting in Geneva where we talked about um, very specific aspects of interoperability and the so-called architecture of this global, um, you know, Arctic and polar, but globally connected system. And so there, I'm not going to go into the details here, but we start getting down into the weeds. You know, what are these specific protocols that people are using to share metadata, uh, semantic data? How are people sharing the actual data? Um, what are the possibilities for web services, et cetera? So that leads us into the third Polar Data Forum. So for the third Polar Data Forum, we've deviated from the format of the first two Polar Data Fora. Um, which were strictly conference style, you know, people got up, made presentations, we had a little bit of workshop activity, but it was, it was mostly sharing information. The third Polar Data Forum will take place uh, November 18th to 20, uh, 20, yeah, sorry, 22nd, 2019 in Helsinki, Finland. And our friends at FMI in Helsinki are hosting that for us in partnership with the Antaros Project, as well as the Royal Netherlands Institute um, for Oceanography and some others in Europe. And what we're doing there is we're going to have a three-part uh, sorry, a two-part meeting where the first two days will be um, typical sort of conference and uh, workshop type activities. I'm just going to switch over to the website now and I'll walk you through a little bit of it. But um, that's the you know, information sharing and we're going to you know, have a number of talks uh, on a, a bunch of different topics. Um, so you see here their paper and poster themes and it's you know, ranging from how do we continue to build the community to actual you know, data management strategies and technologies and so on and looking at different communities, social science and humanities, indigenous applications and so on. Um, but we're then going to spend the following three days, the Wednesday through Friday on working in hackathon activities. And so we're going to follow up um, on some of the work that was done in Boulder last year, looking at policy, broader context and scenarios. And so we have one activity there where we're looking at various data policies and trying to you know, extract common themes from those so that we can come up with sort of a, a template or a, a prototypical uh, data policy for those who are interested and, and engaging. Um, the federated search work will continue. And in there, we're actually looking at a hackathon that would develop technology that is going to stitch together these various uh, catalogs. Um, so we may not end up with the finished product, but by the end of that meeting, we're expecting to have a very good strategy and some of the actual development work done in stitching that together. And happily, we have a number of projects there that are funded to do this type of work under various grants, including uh, one that I'm working on in Canada, and we have partners in the US as well as Europe who have funding to do this. Um, we're looking at things like semantics. So great, you've exchanged your information across projects, but you know, do I really understand what the, what the data means and what are the vocabularies being used and so on? So there'll be a combination, you know, hackathon, some actual coding and so on, but also a section there for non-experts who wanna learn more about what's uh, happening in that area. 
And then we have a whole bunch of different uh, topics, um, some that are more domain specific. So Eric Buke and others um, um, with Eurogoos are going to organize one that's focused specifically on marine data and what's happening in their community. And then we have a number of, of annual meetings for the various um, groups that are involved, including Arctic Data Committee and, and the Antarctic Group is, and the EU Arctic Cluster. So I think um, our opportunity here to connect is through our abstract submission. So Sandy mentioned uh, submitting an abstract and that's going to go in, in both directions is if you go to our abstract submission page, um, what we're asking and, and the deadline is next Friday, the 6th of September, um, and you can submit through the site. Um, not only are we asking for abstracts, we're asking for people to think about um, submission of white papers that will then go into the Arctic Observing Summit. So what I expect is in keeping with what Hayo said, is that we're not going to do the shotgun approach and send you know, 15, 20, 30 different papers, but take the opportunity, and although we'll be past the white paper deadline, we've discussed this in advance, to have a synthetic white paper, at least one, possibly a couple, one that's more technical, one that's more sort of policy and community building that would go into the AOS process. Um, so this is the idea of this, this sort of move towards a convergence. So we're not doing this in, in the data silo and the observing silo over there and, and so on. Um, so that call is out there and we will see this idea of the, a white paper um, or two that would come out of it as the major deliverable for this activity. Um, another thing to just highlight is I mentioned that there is a lot of activity going across all kinds of different disciplines and there's the whole data community that are not the Arctic data community or Antarctic data community. Um, so in this time, we've been very clear for the abstracts that we want to talk about issues that are quite specific to our regions and to the kinds of science that's being done in those regions. Um, so we will have some general approaches um, and so on, but we're really gonna be thinking about, you know, what does it mean to be sharing data in the Arctic or the Antarctic? What are the issues, for example, that uh, indigenous people of the Arctic are facing and, and that type of thing. Um, now that will feed into the broader data community though, because many people in that larger global community have indicated that we're making really significant progress in the polar communities and particularly in the area of interdisciplinary work is the few people in the global community that I work with have seen as much activity across disciplines as they have seen in the polar regions. So it's of great interest um, there. So I'm going to leave it at that. And I think I'll just simply say that I encourage you to submit an abstract. We will have um, possibility for online participation and posters and so on. So even if you're not able to, to make it to Helsinki, we would very much like your input into the, uh, the process and we'll then move that forward into the broader discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really a great overview. Um, Renee Tatusko is asking if anybody from NCAI is plugged into the Polar Data Forum. Do you I know the registration they, list? <laughs> yeah, I know they're aware of it. Um, so I also I advise the Arctic Data um, Center at uh, in Santa Barbara, and so they had their annual meeting this week, and um, Melissa Zwang was there, and uh, so they're they're aware of it. I don't yet. I haven't looked at the registration numbers recently. Uh, I've told this morning we've got pretty good registration, so I can take a look and see. And if not, be happy to uh, to nudge the folks there because it'd be great to have as many uh, people as we can, and particularly in major centers like NCEI. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Any other questions for Peter? Great, thank you, Renee. Okay, um, if there's not anything else, I think we'll open the floor really quickly to um, hear some updates from everyone. Uh, so if you have anything to contribute, uh, feel free to chime in. Otherwise, we'll, we'll give you guys back a little bit of your time on this, what's today, Thursday. <laughs> um, so are there any updates from the community? Uh, Bill, I see your hand is up. Hi. Um, the team behind the Arctic Research Mapping application, rmap.org, 
has released a new viewer that's in three dimensions, 3D, and it's a beta. We're really excited about it. Uh, tons of uh, great new features. And so check it out and we're appreciating any feedback. Awesome. Uh, can you post a link to that in the chat? Okay, uh, anyone else with an update? I guess I have a brief one. Um, I just got back from the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Healy uh, on the 1901 mission. Um, we deployed over 100 CTV casts, um, did it quite a number of grabs. Um, if any of you tuned in to the uh, Marine Ecosystems ca call yesterday, uh, Jackie Gardner gave a great overview of kind of what we were able to do. Um, and I'll post a link to that in the chat. So you guys can go back and watch it. Um, but it was a really great trip. We got all the way up to 75 degrees north, um, but didn't see any sea ice. So that was really surprising. Um, and we saw evidence of a harmful algal bloom up off of Barrow. So that was really interesting as well. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, I can keep you updated on kind of the results of the Healy cruise. I have a couple of just brief uh, updates, given that we're talking about international. Um, my affiliation for the last decade or so has been with NSIDC at U Colorado, and I retain an affiliation there, but I've just moved to Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Um, so two developments that I think would be of interest to the IRAPA community. One is that uh, the Canadian Consortium for Arctic Data Interoperability, which is uh, led by our, our friend Mary Beth Murray at University of Calgary, but involves Carleton, uh, Laval University, Waterloo, and many other partners, um, has now been funded and is um, starting operations. So we'll be focusing um, on bringing all of those organizations, including the National Inuit or Organization, ITK, and the Inuvialuit Regional Corporation, uh, together to focus on interoperability, including ethical interoperability and, and that type of thing. Um, and we're working closely with our partners in Europe, um, with Intaros and, and the EU Arctic Cluster, as well as partners uh, down in the US on that as well. So I'll, uh, I'll keep you up to date on that, but if you're doing any sort of cross-border work um, in Canada, um, just be aware that there is now a group that is, is funded for the next three years at minimum um, at a very you know, healthy level to, to encourage interoperability across Canadian institutions as part of a global system. Um, so that's one, and the other, it, which is not, been fully announced yet, but I think I can say it here, is a uh, major um, network has been funded um, focused on permafrost. Um, so a network of Canadian researchers who will be getting together to organize, um, further organize research around permafrost and active layer and so on. And CCADI, the group that I mentioned on interoperability, is a partner on that. So we're going to be bringing the, the data sharing and interoperability together hand in hand with, with the science. So that will be uh, led by Stefan Gruber, who's at, at my institution here at Carleton University, but has about at least 50 partners uh, involved. So you'll see an informal announcement on that soon, but I think it's very clear that we want to have very close uh, interactions and partnership with our, our um, friends in the US who are, are doing uh, related research. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else? Kelly, I'll, I'll add a little additional information. Um, I mentioned, I just dropped this into the chat as well. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Third Arctic Science Ministerial, which is planned for um, 2020 to be co-hosted by Iceland and Japan. And, um, and the Arctic Observing Summit and the ASSW and Iceland are, are certainly gonna be um, inputs to the next Arctic Science Ministerial, um, as is ISAR-6. 
um, which is a, a revolving symposium on Arctic research that takes place in uh, Tokyo every other year. And um, their call for abstracts uh, uh, and registration went out and their uh, abstract deadline is October 7th. So if you are interested, um, there's some really interesting, uh, some interesting themes that you can um, access under the call for abstracts, uh, session information, etc. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at it and, and think about participating. All right, thank you so much, Sandy. Oh, oops, sorry. And that, uh, 15 minutes of your day back. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And um, I'll have the, the notes posted as soon as possible. <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly, and welcome home. Thank you. Bye.